Liebe Zuhörerinnen, liebe Zuhörer, gleich hört ihr mein Gespräch mit Bruce Shelley über die Entstehung von Civilization. Bruce Shelley war zu dieser Zeit die rechte Hand von Sid Meier, hat ihm assistiert bei der Erstellung von Civilization und wir unterhalten uns jetzt gleich über seine Karriere vorher. Wie kam er eigentlich zu Microprose? Was waren dort seine Aufgaben? Wie kam es zu Civilization und wie hat er mit Sid Meier zusammengearbeitet? Also der Kern unseres Gesprächs ist dann die Microprose-Zeit und da eben vor allem Civilization. An dieser Stelle nur noch der Hinweis, wie üblich, gibt es am Ende des Gesprächs eine deutschsprachige Zusammenfassung. Bruce Shelley ist Amerikaner, das heißt, wir sprechen Englisch miteinander. Aber für diejenigen von euch, die lieber meine deutsche Zusammenfassung hören, die können gleich zu der entsprechenden Kapitelmarke springen. Und jetzt viel Spaß mit dem Gespräch mit Bruce Shelley. Stay a while. Stay forever. Ein Podcast über alte Spiele von zwei alten Männern. Stay Forever mit Gunnar Lott und Christian Schmidt. With me today is renowned game designer Bruce Shelley, who has worked on and helped shape not just one, but several all-time favorite computer games. Bruce, I'm very happy to have you on the show today. Thanks, Chris. My pleasure. So which game do you get asked about more often? Civilization or Age of Empires? I think Age of Empires more often. You know, Sid Meier was the genius behind Civilization, and I was, you know, I was his assistant. But he was the guy who really put that game together. But I was part of the team at Ensemble Studios that built the Age of Empires franchise. And It's, it's, I've run into more people who are familiar with that game, I guess, over the years than Civilization, probably. Okay, well, today we're going to explore your role for Civilization in more depth, because that is the topic that I'd like to cover with you, specifically the creation, the making of Civilization. But before we go there, let's talk about how you got into the industry, because when we at Stay Forever speak to game designers of that era, they almost to a man and woman share one biographical data point, and that is that they started by programming stuff on their home computer or university terminal or whatnot. But you, I understand, have never been a programmer. That's correct. Yeah, I transitioned out of the board game industry. So I was a graduate student at the University of Virginia and a game club there. A bunch of us started a publishing company to publish role-playing games out of the game club at the University of Virginia. And that wasn't my style of game. I was more interested in complicated board games, war games, and things like that. But that was an introduction to the game industry. I had to travel to trade shows to help move our products, sell our products. So I met other game developers. And then I decided before I got a real job, I would try to make a living in the game industry. And I talked to a couple of game companies. And I actually got an internship at a well-known American board game company called Simulations Publications Incorporated, which published a magazine called Strategy and Tactics Magazine. And it was a game in every magazine. And I worked there for a summer and then their company was struggling, but by now I had even a better resume. And I wrote to several other game companies and one in Baltimore called the Avalon Hill Game Company gave me a job and I worked on board games there, mostly war games, but other kinds of games as well. And after four or five years there, I decided that this was not really working out as a long-term situation. It wasn't paying very well. But they asked me to move into computer games. If they had a computer game division, they asked me to try those. And I said, sure, I'll give that a try. It looked like more of a future. So I worked there for six months or something. And I found out by then I knew that Microprose was in the same city, Baltimore, Maryland. And Microprose was, you know, on the north side of town. And I started talking to them about working for them. And eventually they had me in for an interview and they offered me a job. And That was how I got into computer games. I transitioned. I was part of that generation to transition from paper and board games over to computer games. And I was never a programmer. My job was to write and to hold the vision of the game and explain the vision and figure out what was supposed to happen on screen and explain that to the people who are actually going to make it work. So if you hadn't gone into games, what would you have ended up doing? That's a good question. I mean, I studied science and biology and environmental science as a student. And I was working in that for a while before I decided to find something new. And I was going to graduate school in economics. And I thought I liked, you know, the financial world, something in that area. And it turns out I can write reasonably well. And I could have been maybe a newspaper person, a reporter or something. 
And these are things that I still have some feeling for and still get involved in. I think there were some other options there that could have happened, but I turned what I enjoyed doing as a hobby into a career and I never got that real job. And I talked about, you know, 40 some years as a game developer, that was what happened. Well, I'm glad for us gamers that you took that career trajectory. But at the beginning, how old were you when you started at Avalon Hill? Let's take that point in time. Let's see, I was 34, I think. So mm -hmm. I'd messed around. I'd tried several things by then. I'd been in graduate school, college, had worked in a couple of jobs. And I was still trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I mean, I was a famous American writer who said, by the time you're 40, you needed to know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And so here I was 30-something and still trying to figure it out. But, you know, it worked out. And by the time you joined Microprose, you were close to 40 then? I was 40, yeah, pretty much 40, I think. In 1988, I joined Microprose. I was going to be 40 soon, let's put it that way. Going back to Avalon Hill, our European audience might not be as familiar with Avalon Hill as US Americans would be. What would you say, what standing did Avalon Hill have at the time that you were working there? It was a leading war game producer in the United States. They had been making games for 15, maybe 20 years before that. They really pioneered the idea of war games for the mass market. Games about the American Civil War. They did a game about Waterloo. They did Africa Corps. Those are some of their popular games. Guadalcanal. A lot of wars that the United States have been involved in. And these were pretty traditional war games. Well designed and simple to play and very popular at the time. And I found mine the first time I was at the beach with my family at the ocean. And we had a rainy day. There was no point in going down to the water. We went into town and I found a game about the World War I, of all things, in a store. It was 1914, about the first year of World War I. And it was a tedious game, big, lots of stuff. But to me, I was interesting as hell because I was learning. To me, it was like you took the maps. That, when you bought a history book, there were maps only in the inside cover and the back cover. And what these games did was take those maps out, put them on a table, and align all the units that were involved in the fighting. And you'd get to refight the campaign, the battle, the war. And you'd learn quite a bit about it. You know, you could read about it, but here you could actually sit down and be the general on one side or the other and see the decisions that they had to make. And it was really illustrative to me. I mean, how it really added a whole dimension to the study of history, especially these historical situations. I've read a couple of interviews and articles about your biography, and typically your time at Avalon Hill is shortened to a sentence which names the games that you've worked on. But how can I imagine that? What did a game designer like yourself at Avalon Hill do? Well, when I was hired, they had bought a bunch of games from another company called Victory Games. And I was actually hired to go through the Victory Games catalog and see which ones could become Avalon Hill games and choose and then redo them for our artwork and any rules changes or anything like that that needed to be done. Mostly it was just redoing them packaging and then i was given like a little bit of a free hand i mean i found other games out there that i thought would become avalon hill games they were small locally published things and one game was called titan some guys i think in wisconsin or minnesota had made this game called titan and they had an expansion pack it was going out of print they weren't going to make any more of them and i said well, this is a pretty good game why don't we redo this one as an avalon hill game and i took the original game and the expansion pack and put them together to make one new game And it was a very well-received, popular game called Titan. And then I'm trying to think, it was another game that was going out of print about B-17s over Europe in World War II. And I redid that one as an Avalon Hill game. And I redid a game about the invasions of Britain. I think it was called Britannia, about all the different people who invaded Britain a couple thousand years ago. And we redid that one. And if you say you redid it, what did that entail? Because what you're describing right now sounds more like the work of a product manager than the work of a game designer. Yeah, I was called a developer, not a designer. You know, I was take the game and maybe change some rules if I thought it played better or something like that, or just combine stuff. The most popular game I think I worked on at that time frame was called 1830. It was a railroad game that was designed in Britain. I had played that fellow's games a lot. He did an 1829 series about railroads in Britain. He did a civilization game, which later had an impact on something else we made when we made civilization years later. And I was telling him, you should make a game about railroads in America. I, you know, I got that communicated with him and he says, yeah, that'd be great. So he designed a game for us and we sent it to us. And I felt it was too hard or not as interesting enough for the American audience. So 
we had an awful lot of correspondence back and forth about what we could do to change the game. I'm playing it with guys in Baltimore, and we're talking about what we would change or what we don't like or did like. And he's playing it with his brother and a couple of guys in Northampton, England, and they're talking about what the, you know, and they're really heavily dominated by what he thinks. Everything he did, they loved. And everything in America, we didn't really like so much. <laughs> so one of the things about the game, I want to bore you with this, but the game unfolded. You can only buy one railroad to start the game. And when that one was functioning, you could start the second one. And when that was functioning, you could start the third. And it had a slow progression. I thought America was more of a wide open place. So the big change we made was all the railroads were available. You have so much money. If you want to start a railroad in New York or Baltimore or Philadelphia, wherever you want to start it, that's up to you. You got to make it work. And that opened the game up dramatically. And everybody, you know, thought it was a big improvement. So after a while, my friend in Britain, Francis Tresham, I, I think he's actually passed away now, but he says, well, I just want the game published in America. So you do anything you want with it. So he gave us like a free hand. So we made the changes that I thought were important or we thought were important and it published it. And it's a pretty popular game even today. I mean, I know that there's a whole series of they're called 18 double X games about railroading. And there's a lot of them apparently. And I've been told that 1830 is one of the best or one of the most favorite of all the ones that they made. And I think that I'm pretty proud about that, if that's the case, you know, that, that we had an influence on that whole series and that they're still very popular. I can imagine. And you also mentioned that you then had a brush with the microcomputer games division of Avalon Hill because they moved into computer games pretty early, if I'm not mistaken, like in the early 80s. Yeah, they were a pioneer in computer games. They were publishing computer games in like 87, maybe. 86. I'm not sure how far back they go. Back to 1980, actually. That's when they originally started. Okay. Yeah. Well, they always did things as inexpensively as they could. So <laughs> basically, one guy would make a game for them and they would sell it. Mm -hmm. And that worked really well when there was nothing out there. But as soon as like good games came along or good studios started publishing, like Electronic Arts and Microprose started making games, their products were not up to snuff as far as being competitive. You know, they would rely on one guy working at home somewhere to make a game. They asked me to look at some of these. And I remember the first computer game I worked on had four colors, four color graphics. You know, we could use white, black, cyan, and magenta on the screen. And I remember I had to work with these guys. One was doing a basketball game, and this terrific NBA all-star was not a good rebounder. And I said, this guy's the best rebounder in the country. How is he not a rebounder in your game? I don't understand this, you know. So those are the kind of issues I was dealing with, was trying to help these guys I think they were all men, polished their products into a usable game. But they were really simple. And what happened was a friend of mine said, you should try this game. And he asked me to play Sid Meier's Pirates on Amiga or something like that. And I went over to South. We played that game. I said, wow, now here's a game that's pretty interesting. This is much better than things that I'm working on. you know." And so I said, well, if I'm going to try and make a job out of this, I should talk to this company about a job. I actually built a solitaire game called Patton's Best, which was about tanks, a U.S. tank division in World War II, and it was played by Solitaire. I said, well, here's a demonstration. I can make a computer game. You know, All the games back then were pretty much Solitaire. So I built a Solitaire board game. I could probably help them with a Solitaire computer game. So by Solitaire, you mean a single-player game? Yeah, a single-player game. Mm -hmm. You don't play against another person. You play against the game. And how did you make that? Well, I made it at Avalon Hill. You know, I did a lot of incredible amounts of research on what it was like to work in a tank during World War II, especially an American Sherman tank. And it was based on the experience of one American tank division called the Fourth Armor. It was part of Patton's Third Army. And the Fourth Armor Division was considered, quote, his best. I mean, one of the guys in serving that regiment wrote a book about his experience called Patton's Best. And we used that title for our computer game and just followed the experience of that tank division across Europe where the battles they fought. And so the game would generate these situations where you had to figure out how to survive in your tank and help fight you know and i did a lot of research on what happened when tanks were hit and you know and it's funny because years later i met a neighbor who actually served in a sherman tank all across europe from north africa all the way to austria through italy and stuff like that and he told me he said when we ran into the german tanks we backed up and called in for air power because their tanks were much better than ours and we didn't want to fight the tanks so it was pretty funny to hear him tell me that <laughs> not a good basis for a game <laughs> running away no Uh, the 4th Armored did engage with other tanks. There were some famous, famous tank battles they were involved in. So that was a computer game? It was not a computer game. It was a board game that I made. I don't remember the computer games I worked on at Avalon Hill. It was one, some guy was taking wooden ships and iron men, a board game, and making that in a computer game. You know, I thought it was okay. You know, you're just translating the game to a digital format. 
And it was a basketball game I worked on, which I didn't like because I thought the stats were all wrong. <laughs> Sounds like you were not very enthusiastic about the Avalon Hill computer games. I didn't think it was a future. And so I was encouraged to look for another job. And I was happy to find out that Microprose was in the same city, not too far away. And that took me a year, I think, to talk to them. And finally, they got to a point where they were expanding. They'd hired a bunch of people from Coleco, and they had me come in for an interview. I spent the day there, and they offered me a job the next day, which I took. And that was in 1988, 89? Yes, 1988, early 1988. In his memoir, Sid Meier mentioned that he was not involved in hiring you, but that he was surprised afterwards to learn that the company had hired a designer who was not also a programmer, because apparently that was highly unusual at the time. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I always tease him. I'm not teasing him, but I said, you know, you have all these programmers and you have all these artists. And you don't have anybody who's actually made a game before, <laughs> you know. Well, you need to hire me because I've made games, you know. I mean, there's something else that goes on besides programming and art. There has to be you know, a theme behind it. Now, now, Sid was a natural. He was a brilliant game designer. But it turns out it's hard to find people who have all those skills in one person. I mean, there aren't many people that I've met over the years who are great programmers and great designers at the same time. I think they hired me, and it turned out when I got there, there were already other guys there who had not been programmers. I can think of like Lawrence Schick, who's still making games today, He had an office next door to me, and he was not a programmer, to my knowledge. I mean, I don't think he was a programmer. And there might have been others at the time. And gradually, they built out a staff of design people who had not programmers. I mean, there's an awful lot that goes into a game that doesn't involve programming, you know. True, yeah. I mean, and your assumption that this is a specialized occupation, game designer, has proven to be correct, because that's how we understand it these days. But what were you hired for then? In what role, for what project? They were building a game called F-19 Stealth Fighter, and they needed somebody to help with like the maps, build the maps, and then actually build the, it was sort of like art, but we were using 3D technology to build 3D objects. And so I ended up doing that. I remember I built a stealth fighter out of like seven coordinates or 10 coordinates, and they all thought it was great because it minimized the programming need of the computer, and it still looked like the plane we were supposed to be flying. And so... I remember deciding where the air bases would be and maps and worlds. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was more like that kind of work, you know, I mean, you know just building the settings for the things and stuff. And I was in 3D world a lot. That's what I remember. Okay. That's pretty interesting to me because to be honest, Bruce, I had difficulties understanding your role at Microprose during the time that you were there. Here's a list of things that you did while you were at Microprose that I took from several sources. So you were doing the 3D objects for flight simulations. I think you were also doing research for flight simulations. You wrote game manuals. You made a budget analysis for Railroad Tycoon for the management of Microprose. You, at the request of Sid Meier, wrote a list of things that could be improved in Empire, which was a competing strategy game. You were a sounding board for Sid Meier, who bounced ideas and prototypes off of you. And obviously, you assisted Sid Meier with the game design. But even halfway into Civilization, when the two of you had already collaborated on Railroad Tycoon and Covert Action, Sid Meier stated that you were not working full-time with him because you had other assignments within the company. To me, that's kind of all over the place. And most importantly, it's all auxiliary work for someone else. Was there something at Microprose that you owned? Not really. I mean, I was also a producer. We had some outside developers working on a game. It was a game about destroy escorts in World War II. I mean, I had to take a train up to New Jersey and meet this team and talk about their game and t shepherd it through the production process and get it finished and published. And then it was an internal project. Sid had done a game called a helicopter game. I forgot what it was called. Gunship. Gunship, yeah. And they were going to port it over to another program. I think the Commodore 64 or something like that. And I was responsible for that. I was in charge of that project. I had to organize the art and the programming and get it through the production process, get it all tested. And I finished two games on the same day as a producer. They both went, as we used to say, gold. The code was finished and the project was sent off to be manufactured. And I think Commodore 64 and Destroyer Escort went gold on the same day. So I was managing those as a producer. You know, Sid was the guy who was doing most of the art and the programming on those early games internally until the project got lit. 
and got more help. But there were things he didn't want to do. It was like, go meet the sales team or something like that. <laughs> I'd have to go meet the sales team and give a presentation on what we were working on. And I had to work with the people laying out the manuals. I had to run the play tests, you know, because that was another job for a, quote, producer kind of person. I was managing the bug list. And these are the bugs. And he'd decide what was going to fix and what was going to be a feature and what we're going to ignore. And I'd have to go through the testing and make sure that things were fixed. You know, okay, he says this is fixed. Please check this and make sure it is fixed. So, I mean, there was all the little stuff like that. And then part of the every day was talking, just sitting and talking with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would give me a version of the of a game we were working on at some point in the afternoon, maybe at the end of the day. And then I would play it in the morning. I was usually in the offices for him, and I'd play it in the morning for an hour or something like that. And then he'd come in and he'd say, when you're free, come on down. So I'd go down and sit in his office, and we'd sit there and talk, maybe an hour, maybe longer, and talk about what I thought of the latest version, what I liked and didn't like, and you know what he was thinking. And and we would noodle ideas for making it better. And then he'd start programming and I'd go off and maybe do something else. I always had to do one of the responsibilities or I'd just go back and play. It's hard to say. I mean, I know a fellow who sat across the hall. He said, you guys, when you start talking, I couldn't get any work done because it was so interesting <laughs> what you were talking about. You know, the way that game was coming together. He said, I had to either close the door or just sit there and listen because of the talks you guys had about making this game and changing games and just games in general were so interesting. I couldn't get anything done as long as that conversation was going on. So that was really fun to be talking to him about how this worked and noodling the ideas and trying to make it a better game. But Sid Meier was not your manager, right? No, I mean, we didn't know this at the time until the company went public. He was an independent contractor by now. He had been a co-founder of the company, but he didn't want to do some of the things the president wanted to do. So they came to an agreement. The president bought him out. And Sid was just getting paid on the projects. When he finished them, he got so much money for finishing a project. But I was an employee, so I reported to the guy in charge of games development. Who was that? Oh, gosh. Ted Markley was the last one, I think. And before that, it was a fellow named Steve Meyer, who became a really good friend of mine later because we both ended up in Chicago and became good friends. But Steve left at some point. He had a disagreement, I think, with Bill about running the company. Several of the executives left at some point because they didn't get along with the president. And Ted, his job was depending on what the other guys were doing, not what Sid was doing. So we were always last in line for help to make a game, you know, like art, and music and things like that, because his pay depended on what the other people were doing, not what Sid was doing. Sid was going to get so much money for finishing a game. And I was just a piece of stuff laying around that they gave Sid to work with. So they didn't care much about me. I came to work there for a very low salary because I came out of the board game industry. And so years later, when I left, part of the reason was I never caught up to the other designers. I was way behind and everybody else was paying. And that was one of the reasons that I was okay leaving. But that was another story. Yeah, we'll get to that later because that's also an interesting part. But at this point in time, I mean, that's an interesting constellation. You didn't know yet that Sid Meier was an independent contractor. You still thought he was a partner and part of the management team. Yeah, yeah, we did know that. But de facto, Sid Meier could not command any resources within Microprose, right? He could command them, but it was a struggle because the guy who ran the whole division, who everybody worked for, was getting paid on what everybody else was doing, not what Sid was doing. Yeah. So there was a natural bias. Like our bonuses for civilization were penalized because we were late. And my thinking was, well, if you'd given us the art and the music and the other stuff when we needed it, we would have had that game done on time. So I was a little bitter about the fact that our bonuses for finishing civilization were penalized when it was out of our hands when it was going to be done or not. So. But that's maybe just my thinking, and it may not be the case. I don't remember now. Let's keep that in mind. I'd like to come back to that a bit later. Do you still remember how you met Sid Meier? How did he notice you and realize your potential? Well, we were on the same game together. I don't know if I actually physically talked to him. We'd be in meetings or something like that, and I know who he was. And I guess I had to work with him right away. So we had conversations and stuff like that, but... He's a quiet person, pretty distant. You know, he used to say that he would not bother meeting anybody, new employee, until he'd been there like six months. And he was sure that they were going to stay because he didn't want to waste his time. I don't know. That's, that's probably cruel. But he was a very private individual. You know, he's born in Switzerland. He's like a Swiss watchmaker, very private. So I think I had to deal with him immediately. So we got along fine. And then I just worked. I just kept my nose down and worked. I wanted this job to be a success. So I tried to volunteer for extra stuff, you know, that nobody else wanted to do or something like that, like these projects that were not that interesting, like the Commodore game 
there was a programmer there who was considered kind of difficult to work with. And everybody's kind of like rolling their eyes about having to manage him. And I said, I'll take that job. You know, if that's a challenge, I'll take it because I'd like to show that I belong here. And I'd like to solve a problem for the guy in charge. If I can solve this problem for you, that's got to be good for me, right? So let me take that job. So I was doing things like that. And we played board games too. We did a little board gaming playing after work. And I think I was encouraging that. Like I brought the 1830 board game. I made it out one day. We played that. And I think years later, that would be part of the inspiration for Railroad Tycoon. And we brought over the civilization game from Avalon Hill that the same fellow had designed, Francis Tresham. And I think that helped, you know, encourage the idea of what became the civilization computer game. I see. So what was Bruce Shelley like at the time? If Sid Meier was private and quiet, as you mentioned, how would you co-workers have described you? <laughs> Well, I was a little more outgoing for sure. I mean, I wanted to fit in and I got along pretty well with everybody, I think. They had a softball team, so I played softball just to get to know people. And then what was even more valuable, I think, well, maybe not valuable, but they had a basketball court in the warehouse. And I found out they were playing basketball, so I volunteered to play basketball. I had played basketball in high school and I still played basketball, you know, a couple of days a week. You are very tall, right? I'm six foot two, yeah, which is tall for my age. So I played basketball and I remember I'm playing with the executives of the company now. So, you know, not only I'm playing with the guys in the warehouse and executives and a couple of the guys from game side, but most of the people in the basketball games were not in the game development side. They were from the business side. And so I got to know all the executives and people were laughing. They were not, they were laughing kind of stunned, you know, like I'd walk around the building and, and the vice president of marketing or sales or something like that would say, Hey Bruce, how are you today? And the guys are going, Hey, how do you know him? <laughs> I said, well, I played basketball with him a couple of days a week, you know? And I remember, I'll, maybe, I'll tell you this story, funny story, but we're playing basketball and Bill Staley, the president of the company, was part of the game. You know, he's a very aggressive player and he's tough. He's a really hard player. And I wouldn't take that. I fought back you know, I fought hard. And I remember I hit him one time. We're going for a loose ball and we clashed into each other. And I think I knocked the wind out of him. He fell down. Ouch. I'm thinking, you know, I've been in a company a couple of months and I think I just lost my job. You know, I just knocked the, the CEO <laughs> of the company. I almost knocked him out. And he got up and recovered. We got on and went on to play. And after the game was over, I would rush back. We had a bathroom shower in the development side. I went back and showered real quick. And the executives would come down later and shower. You know, the VP of my boss, the head of development, the head of marketing, the head of sales, they all come down later. So I'm finished. I'm coming out of the shower. I got to go to work, right? And I'm thinking, man, did I lose my job? And every one of these executives is going, that was awesome, Bruce. High five. They're all giving me that. <laughs> <laughs> They're all giving me a high five. Like, that was great. So I thought, okay, maybe I haven't lost my job. I don't know. It's funny. <laughs> well, apparently you didn't. I mean, wasn't Bill Steely an Air Force pilot? A military man, so he should know how to take that. Yeah, he was. He was a pilot. He went to Air Force Academy. He's still very big on that. We're Facebook friends, and he's always posting pictures of his colleagues playing golf and talking about the Air Force Academy football team or something. And he played lacrosse in college. He was an athlete himself. And I played lacrosse in college a little bit, too, so we had that in common. But he was a big soccer fan, too. We had soccer games, too. I never played soccer. That was the first time I ever played soccer. Okay, so you've established yourself at My Career Pros. Can you take us on kind of like a mental tour through the offices? You already mentioned the basketball court in the warehouse, but what were the offices like? How many people were there even at My Career Pros? Was it a large company already? That's a good question. I would say probably 100 people, maybe. Okay. The entrance to the building, the main entrance was in the middle of the building. It was one long, thin building, a long one-story building, and you entered in the middle. When you came in, there was a reception area. There's usually somebody there waiting at the door. And then there was a big room where we could all meet, you know, like a conference room. If you went to the left, if you turned left when you came in, you went down to the business side. That's where Bill's office was, the president's office. And that's where marketing was and sales. And the warehouse was in that direction as well. If you turn right, you went through another door, and that's where all the game development was. All the game developers were on the right. The first office, when you went down the hall, the first office on your right was Sid's office, a big office. And as you went down, there was a hallway that went around in a loop, a square, and there was individual offices, and most of us had individual offices. My office was as far away from the front door as you could get, practically. And there was, like, Lawrence Schick was sitting next to me, and one of our top programmers was across the hall. Actually, there were two programmers across the hall from me, and There was another recreation room there on the corner down that way. And we'd have some meetings there occasionally. And there was, you know, just a mixture of artists and programmers and designers in these offices all around this square. That was my home for five years or so. 
Okay, so now let's skip over Railroad Tycoon and Covert Action and go straight into the inception of civilization. So there's a story about that, that Sid Meier tells, that the two of you had finished Railroad Tycoon, and now the question was, what's next? You were sitting on an Amtrak train to New York, discussing a potential next project, and the two of you decided that it had to be something bigger than railroads. Okay, what's bigger than railroads? the entire history of human civilization. <laughs> Do you remember it that way too? I don't remember exactly that conversation, but you know, like I said, we talked every day, sometimes for hours, an incredible number of stuff got covered. Sometimes it had nothing to do with our work. But, you know, it was very interesting. He and I were both very avid readers, reading of all kinds of history and stuff. And I think, as I recall, you know, the idea that a topic should be a big topic. When you're making a game, make it a big game, make it a big topic. And I think we were influenced because we played this board game civilization. We'd also been playing a lot of Empire Deluxe and talking about that game. What was right about that game? What was not? You know, what could we do to make it better? And then we talked of it. And we were also influenced by Sim City. you know, that game. I think those three things came together as we were finishing Railroad Tycoon and what he had done with Railroad Tycoon was such a... And I thought that we were looking for uh, something new, as you say. And then, then these three things that we've been playing each brought something to the puzzle. And he came up with the idea, the concept that it would become civilization. I remember, you know, he was always tinkering with his computer. He had projects on his computer all the time, little games he was thinking about. We never knew when something he was tinkering with would turn into a real project. I remember one was about making yourself tiny and going inside the human body and going around and killing organisms cool. as a, like a rocket ship in the bloodstream killing villains. That was one of his games. And there was another one about a family spreading west across the United States, having children, all getting involved with the settlement and its proliferation of the American West was another game he had. And he had several of those. And I think one day, I can remember this explicitly because he gave me a disc in May of 1990. He gave me a five and a quarter floppy disc that had Civilization on it, the first version of Civilization. And I saved that disc because I had not saved the first version of Railroad Tycoon when he gave me that. It went away and got redone or something, rebranded. But I saved that first version of Civilization, and I had it for years and years and years. And I was going to give it to a museum that's recording the history of computer games, and I asked him if that was okay. He said, no, I want that. So I mailed it back to him, and I think his team at Veraxis got it running again. So they actually got the first playable version of Civilization that ever existed off of Sid's computer running again at their offices at some point. I said, you should put that online, let people see that, just what it was like. And it, I think it was a real-time game. And it was you know, a little different than what was finally published. But that was how way we worked. I mean, every day I'd get a new version and play it and go back and talk to him for an hour or two about what we liked and didn't like. And he'd get a new version made. I gave a speech or a presentation years later at the German Game Developers Conference, I think, called Design by Playing. And we learned that making board games. That's how we made board games. And here we are doing the same exact thing with computer games. To prototype early, play it every day, make changes based on what you're thinking about. Forget about these long design documents, just play it and make changes. You know, that was the way he worked. And he didn't let anybody else play it, which I thought was interesting because it became pretty clear pretty soon. This is an interesting game. People are really liking it. And other guys wanted to play it. The people willing to work with wanted to play it. And he said, no, no, for now, it's just Bruce and I. And I'm telling you, for months, I was the only one allowed to play it. What made you special to him? He said years later that I was every man. You know, my tastes were broad enough that they covered a large part of the marketplace. I wasn't an extreme hardcore player and I wasn't a noob and I was you know reasonably smart enough that I captured a big part of the audience and what if I didn't like it it's probably not good for an awful lot of people and if I did like it it was probably good enough and it was just enough of a sounding board for him that I represented the whole marketplace as a tester and now years later after that I said that was a mistake because there were mistakes in that game that were published that had to be fixed pretty quickly and I think we needed to find those earlier. So when I was working, let's say, at Ensemble Studios, we put a heavy emphasis on testing. And we had everybody in the company would play our games at Ensemble every week. You were required to play the game every week, once at least, and talk about it. For age two, we hired some of the best players in the world to come work for us to test the game. Because I thought testing was a little short for civilization, and I wanted to make sure we didn't make that mistake again. When you were looking for new projects, and ultimately civilization then made the cut, I heard Sid Meier mention in passing somewhere that the two of you originally pitched a sequel to Railroad Tycoon to the management. Is that correct? Yes, true. Yeah, there was going to be a sequel to Railroad Tycoon. We actually worked on it 
for a month. I came up with new maps, and I think it was going to be other countries in Europe is where it was going to go. I can't remember, maybe India. I don't remember now exactly what it was in, but the president of the company, you know, he was focused on flight simulators. He wanted a flight simulator every year, you know, being a pilot. He thought that was a big, big moneymaker. And Railroad Tycoon started off slow. It wasn't a massive hit right away or anything. And I think he didn't want to spend any more money on it. So he couldn't really tell Sid what to work on, but I was forbidden to work on it. I was told no more Railroad Tycoon. You, no more Railroad Tycoon. Wow. Okay. So how would you describe the relationship between Sid Meier, who was the company's star designer, and Bill Steely, the president who basically ran the show? I'm not sure how to say that. I think Bill was focused on the company other than Sid, and Sid was the wild card. He could hit a home run, you know, and get a massive hit, or he could do a game that maybe wasn't that big a deal. But Bill was focused on, we were building arcade games at the time. They had a big investment in arcade games. And he had built this other team, so like Brian Reynolds was making games, who went on to be pretty well known for the company. And there were other games being developed. And I don't know, I'm not sure that he got along fine with Sid, as far as I can tell. I never saw any kind of animosity or anything like that. They just got along fine. I think he just basically, if he had to say, he just put up with Sid and hoped that they would deliver something, you know, because Sid had made the company, you know, those early games had made the company. So there was no question that he was important. And he just kind of hoped that he would hit another winner, you know, which, of course, he did. I mean, Civilization was a massive hit and made a lot of money for the company. And I think it opened up the eyes of the management of the company, Bill and others, that, wow, here's a game that's not a flight simulator and is doing fantastic. You know, it's really making money. So I think they got along fine. But Bill was focused on the other parts of the company that he actually could control. I see. I mean, Microprose had at that point already published a couple of strategy games. Sid Meier had written a couple in the 80s, but apparently that was not the genre to be in at that point. I'm not sure what the thinking was. They didn't share their thoughts with me about that kind of stuff. But when Sid asked me to be his assistant or work with him, you know, I said, I'm happy to do this, man. This is great. I thought this was an incredible opportunity for me personally. And I was happy. I was dating the woman I was going to marry at that point. I would work this job for nothing if I could figure out a way to make a living. I'm having so much fun with what I do every day to make these games. It's so interesting and so much fun that I would do it for nothing if I could make a living some other way. Because it was just a blast to work with him. These conversations and the things I was learning and the experience I was having and the games we were making. I mean, I was pretty sure when we were building Civilization that we were making something that's going to rock the world. The gaming world was going to be really, really excited when this game came out. And I mean, one of our salesmen was a Glenn Drover. He now has his own game company. He builds board games now, mostly. And he was hired, but he wanted to be a game designer. But they hired him as a salesman because that's what he was. And he became one of our best salesmen. But every time he was in town for a sales meeting, as soon as he was free, boom, he was down in my office. Okay, show me what Sid's building now. And he was dying to play it. You know, He was asking me all these questions, standing on my shoulder, sitting to pull up a chair and just watch. So, I mean, people knew we were making something really cool, and I knew we were making something cool, and it was just a question of finishing it and getting it in the public's hands. At the point where Sid Meier gave you that first prototype in May 1990, he tells the story that you immediately recognized that prototype as something special. Do you remember what you saw in it? Well, I guess I would say that it embodied all the good things about game development. You know, it started off slow. I have an expression I've used years later called the inverted pyramid of decision making, where you have a couple things to think about. And as soon as you make those decisions, that's opened up, you know, four more, and then it becomes eight, and then it becomes 16 decisions you have to make. And so you're incredibly engaged. You know, there's an expression in gaming, is it fun or is it not fun? But I think as a professional, you need to know what makes it fun. Fun is just the word for the common people. But as a designer, you need to understand why is it fun and why is it not fun? And I think that game engaged my mind with these decision makings. I mean, Sid is actually in a speech he gave one time. A game is a series of interesting decisions. And he told me what, years later that he still believes that's the case. But I think a game is more than just a series of decisions, but it is a series of decisions. And I think he did a good job of capturing that. You know, there's the unknowns. The map was going to be hidden. And you didn't know what was out there. So you're discovering things. You're making decisions. You're exploring. I mean, it's the 4X game, right? It was a classic improvement on that style of game. And personally, I thought it was great because I'm interested in history. I've read a lot about the origins of humanity. So it captured my imagination immediately. And I thought there must be an awful lot of people out there who would find this really interesting as well. And that proved to be true. 
And then you enter that iterative circle that you've described of him making a daily build, you playing it, providing feedback, the two of you discussing it, that turning into the next prototype, and so on and so on. So that was essentially the professional collaboration that you had. But how would you describe your personal relationship or your dynamic? Well, I think we became good friends. I mean, he came to our wedding when I got married. He came to our wedding. We did lunches you know, together. I mean, Railroad Tycoon. We did field trips. I mean, that was incredible. We went up to Strasburg, Pennsylvania, where the steam railroad runs. And the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum is located. There's a hotel where all the hotel rooms are actually railroad cars that you sleep overnight in. So we did this day trip up there. And we just immersed ourselves in electric and railroads. And we went to Washington, D.C., took the train to Washington, D.C., as you mentioned. And we went to the Smithsonian Museum, looked at our railroad exhibit. So, you know, he had a way of getting people fired up for what they're working on. And I think we became friends. We talked like a lot of stuff, not necessarily game stuff. We had several interests. We talked about history and biology. And he's a very interesting person. And our interests mirrored each other in some ways. We read some of the same books or talked about books we read. And we played these board games. And we talked a lot about the skill of a board game designer, the, how a game is actually made. You know, there, Nobody had written a book on game development. There was nothing. You know, you, We all learn by trial and error, you know. So I think what he was interested in doing, and to some extent me as well, is like, how do we get the next level of game designers a couple of rungs up the ladder of learning what to do without having to go through all the hard work that we lived through? I mean, he really gave a lot of thought to what was actually going on as you built a game and the principles of game development and things like that. So the idea of prototyping early, design by playing, you know, play every day, you know, recode, those kind of things. That was very interesting for me. And I think we shared an interest in that because I came from that board game industry, which he had not experienced. And I saw how we did it over there. And there was so many parallels to the same thing. We became pretty good friends, I think. You know, no question about it. I remember going to lunch one time and decide whether we we're going to make Railroad Tycoon or, or Covert Action. I mean, it was a funny lunch. And I said, well, my money's on Railroad Tycoon. I mean, I was interested in railroads as a kid. You know, we used to ride trains to visit my grandparents, overnight trains. And, and I had a model railroad. I had model railroading merit badge as a Boy Scout, you know. So I was interested in trains. And, and so I remember that lunch at a steakhouse. And we sat there and decided that we would do Railroad Tycoon. And he went back and told Bill, we're going to stop working on the covert action game and do Railroad Tycoon. And I think Bill went, okay, whatever. And so... That's how we got to do it. But then that's why we couldn't do Railroad Tycoon 2, because Bill says, okay, I let you skip that spy game, Covert Action, but now I want you to finish it. So we had to finish Covert Action before we could go on to something new. So Civilization was a little bit put on the sideline, and the Railroad Tycoon 2 was completely stopped, and we did Covert Action. And my memory of Covert Action was, one of the things about it was I said, well, this little sub game is not that interesting. Can we do something about making it? He says, nope, nope, nope. We're just finishing this. We're not going to putz around with this game. <laughs> it was not a passion project for either of you. No, he had agreed to do it. And it was interesting enough that he would do it, but it wasn't a passion project at the end. And so I stopped making suggestions about how to make Covert Action better. And we just completed it. And then we got to do Civilization. And as you described, initially civilization was just between the two of you. But at some point, then Sid decided to share it within the company. And in the designer's notes in the manual, there's this line, I think you wrote that, you wrote, it proved to be extraordinarily popular with the employees within Microprose. What did that mean? Well, it means that, you know, when we had a game that needed to be tested, we'd ask people to play it. And Sometimes you had to really work hard to get people to play it and give you feedback. That wasn't the case with Civilization. Everybody wanted to play it. Everybody was playing it and bombarding us with ideas and suggestions and things like that. So it had a tremendous reception within the company when we opened it up to more players. Everybody had to give it a try, and everybody was very enthusiastic. They loved it. They said, okay, this is going to be great. I mean, the way I felt day one, now the whole company felt that way. It seems that everybody was happy to play the game at that point, but you mentioned once that it was pretty difficult to get people to actually work on the game. Why is that? Well, that was because, you know, the, getting people to work on the game was handled by the guy in charge of game development. I mean, we wanted more art, let's say. We wanted more art pieces. We wanted some programming at the front end or back end of the game or something. And so that meant that the guy in charge had to allocate people from the staff to do the work. I mean, Sid couldn't go tell this guy to work. I mean, he had to go to 
our development VP to get people to do it. And he said, well, that guy's busy on something more important to me, you know, so it was a struggle to get help. You know, that's what I meant by that. Eventually, as the company's enthusiasm for the game was just palpable, you know, we got the help we needed, but it still meant the game came out later than expected. I see. Well, art is actually a great segue into the next section of things that I'd like to discuss with you, because I have a couple of questions about specific design elements of civilization that I find striking, and I'd love to hear your take on those. So first of all, in 2017, you did that GDC postmortem with Sid. And in that postmortem, you mentioned that for both of you, graphics were not particularly important. And I mean, if we look at the typical strategy game of that era, they were originally rather bland, I would say. But Civilization ultimately turned out to be a visually rich VGA game with a surprising amount of eye candy. How did that come about? We were going through a transition with graphics in that time frame. You know, I mean, I started off with four color graphics and we were so excited when we got 16 colors we could put in the game. Although we couldn't use all 16, we didn't have the programming power to use all 16. We had to develop a palette. And then we got 64 colors to make a game. And so it was like, wow, we're rich beyond imagining, you know. So I think that we had grown up in a world where we had to be minimalist. The graphics was not something we had a lot of functionality with. So we focused on the decisions the player would make, the game design, not so much what it looked like. And so I came out of a world where what it looked like was secondary to the decision making the player would make, the things the player would be doing. And I think Sid, to some extent, was restricted by that as well. But then when the graphics became more and more of a functionality, we had our art director who had a good ideas about how to make it look better. And so a lot of the decisions about the art fell to the art team and they did a wonderful job. I mean, I think the credit for that in a lot of ways would go to the art people who took that ball and ran with it, made some really good decisions about how it would look. It certainly wasn't me. I mean, I was not art oriented. I was focused on the decisions the player was making, you know, how the game proceeded, you know, the technology and the things you unlocked, how the game would flow. And the art was like somebody else's responsibility. Was there a producer on Civilization? To the extent there was a producer, it was me. You know, I mean, I was the guy who did all the stuff that Sid didn't want to do. And I think that I had a responsibility re liaising with everybody. I mean, the art was decided, I think, by our art director. I'm getting to be an old man. His name is Mike. And I can't remember his last name. But he would make a lot of decisions about art. And he was very good at that. He would have a theme for our look, and I think it was a credit to him that the game looked so well. So I'm imagining right now, and you correct me if that's wrong, that for the longest time during the development, there was basically this prototype with programmer's art that Sid created by himself in there, and that at some point that gets passed on to the art director or they get drawn into that project group. And then they basically just take what's there and expand on that and turn that into beautiful <laughs> art. I think that's probably the case. You'd have to ask Sid how much of his original art went out in the game as it published. I don't know. I don't remember giving a lot of thought to that. I guess I looked at it every day and things were changing every day. So thinking that, oh, uh, Sid's art's been changed never entered my mind. Looking back whatever, 35 years. I don't remember that, thinking about that as much. You know, If it looked better, I was pleased and I was still focused on how I was playing. Maybe everything in that game is new and that's none of it is originally Sid's handmade art. I don't remember now. I'm just reinforcing that point or asking that question because I'd say that, yes, Civilization is a very clever and even elegant game mechanically, but what tends to get overlooked is that for its time, it was also visually very appealing. And I think that is a key element of why it was ultimately such a huge success. It's pretty much the same story with Age of Empires six years later, because I think that most people who saw Age of Empires first recognized it as an extraordinarily beautiful game. And that is part of the appeal that drew people to that game. And I think it's the same with Civilization for its time. That's probably true. I mean, I can't argue with it. I think that's very true. It's like another presentation I made once at a game promise was like, when you're making a new game, you have to be different, you differentiate and innovate. You can't copy. It has to be different when you look at it. Age of Empires was different when you looked at it. It was not Command and Conquer. It was not Warcraft. It was different. 
and it was also historical. But Civilization was different than anything out there at the time, I think. It looked different than some of the other strategy games that were out there. And I think that was a big selling point. It was like the artwork drew you in. It welcomed you. You felt familiar with it. You wanted to explore. You wanted to see more of it. And that's a very positive aspect of the game. If the game can hold your interest because of what decisions you're forced to make, it can also be enhanced and dramatically enhanced by how much fun it is to look at the stuff you're seeing on screen. Indeed. And so I think that perhaps is an underestimated, undervalued aspect of civilization that it did look really great on your screen compared to what was out there at the time and what you've been playing up to that point. So the art was a very positive addition to the game component to it. I'd say there's another undervalued aspect of civilization and that doesn't go back to the art team but to you as the designers so to sit in you because having great game mechanics is one thing but then there's the interactive layer so to speak of the user interface how is information presented to the users and how can they interact with that and quickly coming back to railroad tycoon because i think one of the best things about railroad tycoon is the sidebar which has the minimap and it has the train list with the small representations, visual representations of your trains. That's a fantastic example of what we would today call information design, which is selecting and presenting key pieces of information in such a way that the users can understand them easily and interpret them easily. And I think the same quality is in Civilization, which contains even more systems than Railroad Tycoon did, but it excels at visualizing the pieces of information that the player needs in order to understand them and then essentially manage them. So I think given its complexity, Civilization is pretty easy to read. How did that come about? Was this something that you were striving for? I don't recall. I would say that that is all Sid's responsibility. That's his work. I don't remember having any input on that kind of stuff. And maybe I did. I don't remember. Maybe I told him I liked it and I encouraged him to do more of it. I don't know. But I don't recall ever having conversations where I said, you got to do this. They're missing this. This is missing. You need to put it in there. I don't remember anything like that. But he would present these things in a new version. And I'd say, really like it. That's really positive. It really helped me. Maybe that's the kind of feedback I would give him. But I don't remember personally being instrumental in uh, all that information flow. Okay, I see. So one last thing that maybe you might remember, because there is one thing that is suspiciously absent from the game, and that is a load function. So you cannot load your game, your safe game, from within the game session. You have to quit back to DOS and then restart the entire game to load. And that is such a glaring omission that it has to be on purpose. Do you remember why? I have no idea about that. <laughs> you know, programming issues like that were way out of my bailiwick, you know, and not a programmer. And I thought this was most certainly a design decision that for some reason you didn't want players to just quickly load a game. I had the impression, that would be my theory right now, that Sid and you wanted players to stick with the decisions that they made, even if they turned out to be detrimental and just continue playing. Well, you know, it's possible that that's the decision that was made. I just don't recall it. You know, I don't remember having that being an issue. I'm not the kind of person who's an optimizer who would quit to start over and do it better the second time. I would start playing and then I would just keep going. If I made a mistake, I'd say, well, I'll remember not to do that next time. And I just keep going. The time I had invested in the game at that point would be something I didn't want to throw away. I mean, I'm too Scottish, maybe to throw away all that effort and start over. I don't know. I just don't have any recollection of that being a discussion point. That's fine. Okay, then maybe to wrap up the design part, a quick what-if scenario. What would you say, Bruce, how would civilization have looked like, turned out, if you hadn't been involved? Oh, gosh. I'd say it'd be very close to what it is. You know, I mean, I represented every man, and I was giving him feedback regularly. And I think there's a few of the ideas in the game may have been mine, but... I mean, I work with a bunch of really talented people there. And I think if Sid's partner had been one of the other designers, it would probably have been very similar. I mean, I think the, the essential design was all his. And I don't know if it had been a whole lot different, but I would not have learned as much. So I'm eternally grateful that I was involved. And it made a difference in my life, I think, having worked on that game in the future of my life. So, But I'm not sure that some of my colleagues wouldn't have done very well working with him on that team. Maybe because we got along real well, it helped him move ahead and maybe fast, maybe faster. Some of my colleagues were more confident in their ability, let's say. It might have been argued more for something that he didn't really want. 
I mean, I make my case, and if he says no, then I say, okay, the decision's made. <laughs> but I think some of my colleagues might have been saying, hey, this is not right. You know, I'm telling you, you got to change this. They'd been more aggressive about fighting for their position. So maybe I was a little easier to work with than somebody else, but I'm not sure that he couldn't have made that game without my help. It sounds like you may be underestimating your role, even if you were primarily the sounding board, but it seems like you helped Sid organize his thoughts, make decisions, get to quick decisions as well, and keep that back and forth of ideas and feedback going. That's very possible, and maybe because I'm this kind of person I am that worked really well for him and it encouraged him. You know, like I said, some of my other people might have had a much higher confidence in their own abilities and argued more forcefully and take longer to get decisions made or something like that. I don't know. But, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I think we had a great relationship. We work really well together. It probably helped the game maybe more than I'm willing to say. But I think he was a smart guy. He was a genius on that project. And I was the second stringer and I helped him. And there's no question about it. But he would have done that game without me. I would have never done that game without him. I don't think it's hard to say. You were the representation of the audience in a way, which is extremely important. That's a good analogy, I think. But I was a smart enough audience that I would give feedback and have ideas. And it wasn't just the average player. I mean, I had some skills and some experience, and I'm sure it helped him. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that providing useful feedback is an art in itself. It's not a skill that everybody possesses. But anyway, so the game gets released in 1991. At which point did you realize that it was a success, a massive success? Even? I don't really know exactly when. I don't recall. I just know that the reviews were terrific. I'm not even sure if they ran out of them at some point. You know, they didn't make enough in the first run, and it's possible. I don't remember that. You know, I just know that it seemed to hit the ground running. You know, it got great reviews, and people were talking about it. And at the time, we didn't have an internet, and so... The word of mouth was like the magazine articles took a while to appear. And then, you know, the sales numbers were our only really feedback. And then, of course, there were some problems with the game. You know, people figured out a way to beat it or easily or something or cheat. So we had to do some coding right away. At some point, they had to redo some things really quickly. We didn't have the instantaneous feedback that you do today. You know, when something is published within 24 hours, you've got a lot of people who tried it and a lot of social messaging is like flowing you know so you know right away something about your game it took a while for us to get feedback but at the scale we were used to it was very fast and very positive positive. and did the success of civilization change anything at microprose oh, i'm not sure about that i would think that the management team was a little more open to different ideas instead of just simulators well there's a market out there for something else you know i think that they were pretty impressed with how that game was selling And the other teams were encouraged to make some different kinds of games, I think. So the other people working there got permission to work on some different kinds of games. Okay, now we're coming back to your exit at Microprose. Now, the interesting thing is, at that point in time, Civilization is out, it's a smash hit. You and Sid Meier had proven for the second time that you were something of a dream team. <laughs> Regular Tycoon, Civilization. You have commented earlier that... This was your dream job, working with Sid in particular. And Sid commented that he enjoyed working with you very much, <laughs> put it out like that. And yet, less than a year later, you're leaving Microprose. How did this dream team got broken up? Well, I was married by then. Um, my wife was an executive with a big bank, Citibank. And they offered her a job that would force her to work for somebody she didn't really care about that much. And so she decided to retire and find a job in the Maryland, Baltimore, Washington area. They wanted her to move again. She'd already moved nine times for the company and they wanted her to move again. So I was happy with my job. And so she said, I'll find something else. And so she took a year off and looked for another work. And then it turns out the economy was in terrible shape and she was having trouble finding her job. And meanwhile, Sid and I were putzing around with a civil war game about the Battle of Gettysburg, I think is what it was, or the American Civil War. That's what we were messing around with. I actually left the company at the Christmas party. It was my last event in 1992. So I worked there in 91 and 92 on other things. I think it was mostly the Civil War game. And the problem was that my wife's job paid three times what I was making. And she was offered a job in Chicago three times what I was making. And we were struggling a little bit with her not working. I was the lowest paid designer in the team at the company. And I kept getting raises, but they were not catching me up to what the other guys were making. So people were telling me, you're getting way underpaid. You know, this is not fair. And I'm going, well, 
So we decided we would go, we would leave, you know, I mean, the Civil War game was not really going to take off, I think. And so I didn't know what we were going to do next. And the company was struggling a little bit, I think. I don't know. It wasn't doing great with other projects. And I don't remember the whole thing, but basically it was an economic decision. We could live on my wife's salary, couldn't live on mine. So we moved and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I actually was hired by a a California book publisher to write strategy guides for computer games because they had written books about civilization and maybe railroad tycoon also and so i I asked him i said hey would you be interested in me having these books and they said absolutely you know you wrote these manuals you can write so they hired me to write books about games and i actually worked on a strategy guide for the colonization game that brian reynolds did for microcros so i wrote that strategy guide and three or four others or something and that's what i did for the next pretty much the next two years so you mentioned that you were one of the lowest paid game designers at microcros I wonder, I mean, this might be a bit of a sensitive question, but you were working with Sid Meier and you had this great working relationship. I mean, we know that Sid was no longer a partner at Microprose, but he certainly was someone with clout in the company. I wonder why didn't he leverage that clout to give his co-designer a great raise or a bonus or to retain him after all? I don't think it ever came up in the conversation, you know. It wasn't that big a deal. I mean, I think other guys were making more money. I mean, so one guy was telling me, you're way underpaid compared to what other people were making. I know for a fact that when I was hired, there was another guy they were interviewing, and he wanted X amount of money, and I was hired for significantly less than him. And then six months later, he showed up. So I figured he must have got what he wanted, right? So right away, I thought, you know, hey, maybe he did get that money. Why did they pay me like, you know, $7,000 less or whatever it was? Even though they kept giving me raises, they said, well, you got a good raise. And I said, yeah, but did I catch up to anybody? And then I recruited a friend of mine to come work. And I think they repaid him more than I was making. I was already working on these games. And they recruited a guy to work in their other game division for more than I was making that had no experience in these games. It wasn't eating at me or anything like that, but I was happily married. And my wife was making three times my salary. And I didn't know what the future of the company was. They were struggling in some cases. You know, the company was sold not too long after I left, you know, within a couple of years, I think it was sold, you know, to another company. So I don't remember much about it. It maybe was just an adventure to go to a new place and start something new. I worked for two years with something with Sid, where he didn't come up with any other ideas for a game that was going to be anything. You know, the Civil War game was eventually published. He did it with Jeff Briggs, but it didn't have the same feeling of anything like what we had done with Civilization by any means. Did you feel appreciated at Microprose? I did. What mattered to me was what Sid thought and what my colleagues thought. The other people, those managers, you know, I was just another cog in the wheel, you know, and especially whatever I did for Sid was fine. They liked it, but I wasn't thought of anything special. I will say when I left, they had a party for me, which I don't think they ever had for anybody. They actually had a party and people dressed up and it was really, really, really nice. You know, they really sent me off in style. So I think I was appreciated. You know, I remember feeling really moved by the fact that they actually took time out of the day to have a party to say goodbye and made fun of me and stuff like that. You know, it was really nice. Do you wish that you would have had the opportunity to work with Sid Meier again? At one point, I talked about it because I talked about working with him from distance. You know, I said, "Look, I'm going to be in Chicago, in the Chicago area. I could work with you, you know, remotely." And he said, "No, I don't think it works the same. No, he just wasn't interested in it." So. I look for something else to do. Okay. So that concluded your time at Microprose. And I mean, from the perspective of a gamer, I would say that's a good thing because ultimately that led to you working on Age of Empires, which obviously became another classic. But that's a story for another day. So Bruce, (laughs) thank you so much for joining me and for giving us so much insight into the development of civilization and your role in it. Thank you. You're welcome, Chris. I mean, like I tell you, it was a dream to work on that project. It was a great experience. It opened up doors for my future, you know, and I learned so much. And I'm always grateful for the opportunity to work at Microprose and especially work with Sid. It's great. Vielen Dank an dieser Stelle nochmal an Bruce Shelley. Das war ein sehr angenehmes Gespräch. Und jetzt fasse ich für euch kurz zusammen, worüber wir gesprochen haben und was er erzählt hat. Ich habe ihn zum Anfang gefragt, wonach er eigentlich häufiger gefragt wird. Nach Civilization oder nach Age of Empires? Und da sagt er, und das setzt auch so ein bisschen gleich den Fokus für das weitere Gespräch, Age of Empires war das Spiel, wo er tiefer involviert war, wirklich fester Teil des Designteams war. Und er sagt auch vorneweg, Civilization ist das Spiel von Sid Meier. Und er hat da nur mitgewirkt. 
Okay, aber dann gehen wir kurz in die Vorgeschichte. Wie kam Bruce Shelley eigentlich zu Microprose? Bruce Shelley war knapp 40, als er bei Microprose angefangen hat. Das heißt, er hatte vorher schon einiges gemacht, schon diverse Dinge gesehen und das heißt vor allen Dingen recht viel studiert. Er hat in der University of Virginia erstmal Biologie und Umweltwissenschaften studiert, hat in dem Bereich dann auch gejobbt, ist dann nochmal an die Uni zurückgegangen, dieses Mal in BWL, hat versucht herauszufinden, was er eigentlich machen möchte in seinem Leben. Während dieser ganzen Zeit an der University of Virginia gab es dort einen Spieleklub. Spieleclub nicht im Sinne von Computerspiele, sondern das waren Bretsch- und Pen-and-Paper-Spiele. Und mit einer Gruppe von Mitgliedern aus diesem Club heraus hat er dann einen kleinen Verlag für Pen-and-Paper-Rollenspiele gestartet. Das war, wie er sagte, eigentlich gar nicht sein Genre. Ihm waren die komplexen Tabletop-Wargames, also die Kriegsspiele, viel lieber. Aber für ihn war das eine Eintrittskarte in die Spieleindustrie. Also auch hier wieder Spieleindustrie im Sinne von Brettspiele, physische Spiele. Und die Chance wollte er doch mal nutzen. Insbesondere, weil er durch sein Engagement in dieser kleinen Firma auf Messen gekommen ist, mit Herstellern in Kontakt gekommen ist und so bekam er dann auch ein Praktikum bei einer Firma namens Simulations Publications Incorporated, Anbieter von Strategiespielen, insbesondere von einem monatlichen Magazin namens Strategy and Tactics Magazine, wo immer das Regelwerk für ein ganzes Spiel enthalten war. Dort war er am Endeffekt nur einen Sommer lang, stellte dann fest, der Firma geht es gar nicht so gut, schreibt dann Bewerbungen in dieser Zeit und mit aber der Qualifikation dieses Praktikums kam er bei einem der wirklich Großen der Branche unter, nämlich bei Avalon Hill in Baltimore, Maryland. Da ist er 34 durch diesen Zeitpunkt. Avalon Hill ist der Marktführer in den USA für die ernsthaften Strategiespiele, die Kriegsspiele, die Tabletops, Pionier auch in diesem Bereich, viel historische Szenarien, oft Weltkrieg, Zweiter Weltkrieg. Fuß erzählte, dass er ursprünglich in Kontakt überhaupt mit diesen Spielen gekommen ist, als er mal mit seiner Familie wohl noch als Jugendlicher einen Urlaub am Strand hatte und bei einem Regentag haben sie in einem örtlichen Laden dann ein erste Weltkriegsstrategiespiel entdeckt von Avalon Hill und da ist er drin versunken. Das war zwar sehr kleinteilig, komplizierte Regeln, aber das war wie, sagte, wie wenn die Karte aus einem Geschichtsbuch zu Leben erweckt wird und es sei auch sehr lehrreich, so was zu spielen. Nun, wie gesagt, er kommt zu Avalon Hill, dort wird er angeheuert, um sich durch den Katalog zu arbeiten einer anderen Firma, die Avalon Hill gerade aufgekauft hatte, Victory Games, und zu entscheiden, welche Spiele neu aufgelegt werden sollen und da auch Anpassungen vorzunehmen. Und das dann auch für andere Spiele, die an Avalon Hill herangetragen werden in dieser Zeit. Wir sind hier Mitte der 80er. Ein Beispiel, das er nannte, war ein Spiel namens Titan. Das kommt von einem kleineren örtlichen Hersteller. Die hatten da schon das Hauptspiel an einem Addon veröffentlicht. Das ist eine Art Schach mit Fantasy-Kreaturen auf einem sechseckigen Spielfeld. Und dann hat Avalon Hill das übernommen. Und seine Aufgabe war, dieses Spiel mit dem Addon zu kombinieren, das Regelwerk zu verfeinern und das letztendlich veröffentlichungsfertig zu machen für Avalon Hill. Also er war viel beschäftigt mit Regelanpassungen, Ausstattung und so weiter. Mir kam das nicht unbedingt wie die Arbeit eines Game Designers vor, sondern eher wie die eines Product Managers. Und er sagte dann auch, ja, sein Titel da war Developer, also Entwickler. Was er bei Avalon Hill kaum gemacht hat, nicht nicht, aber kaum war, sich eigene Spiele auszudenken. Also auch wenn wir Bruce Shelley dann später als jemanden kennen, der in der Spielebranche schwerpunktmäßig als Designer arbeitet, das ist vielleicht das falsche Bild von dem, was er gemacht hat. Nicht nur bei Avalon Hill, sondern auch bei Michael Post, da kommen wir gleich noch dazu. Das bekannteste Ding, an dem er jedenfalls bei Avalon Hill gearbeitet hat, ist das Spiel 1830, 1830, ein Eisenbahnspiel, das aus England kommt, von Francis Tresham. Der hatte da in England schon Eisenbahnspiele veröffentlicht und Avalon Hill hat dann die Rechte gekauft, um das in Amerika zu veröffentlichen. Und da war Bruce Shelley die verantwortliche Liaison in Amerika, hat mit Francis Tresham über den Atlantik telefoniert. Und der Tresham hat sich also eine amerikanische Variante seines Spiels sozusagen ausgedacht, das 1830. Und im Zusammenspiel zwischen den beiden wurde das dann von Shelley für den US-Markt angepasst und vorbereitet. Ihm war das Spiel zum Beispiel zu schwierig. Eines der Probleme, die ihn gestört haben, war, dass man in der Originalversion von Tresham nur eine Eisenbahnlinie nach der anderen bauen konnte. Und die Anpassung, die er zum Beispiel vorgenommen hat, war, dass von Anfang an in diesen großen USA alle Eisenbahnlinien verfügbar sind und man sich selber aussuchen kann, an welcher man bauen möchte, was das Spiel offener, flexibler macht. Aus diesen 1830, was ein super populäres Spiel war für die Verhältnisse von Avalon Hill, ist dann eine ganze Serie geworden, die bis heute läuft. 
Das geht so eine ganze Weile und nach vier oder fünf Jahren verlegt er seinen Schwerpunkt dann in die Computer Games Division von Avalon Hill, denn es ist auch schon seit langer Zeit ein Publisher von Computerspielen. Also Avalon Hill publischt sowohl externe Spiele als auch lizenziert oder setzt die eigenen Brettspiele um als digitale Versionen. Bruce Shelley ist aber nicht sonderlich begeistert davon. Also zum einen sagt er, Avalon Hill steckt da nicht viel Aufwand rein in die Entwicklung von Computerspielen. Meistens kaufen sie von irgendwelchen externen Leuten halt Programme ein, die auch meist simpel gestrickt waren. Avalon Hill ist da früh dabei, also seit den späten 70ern, Anfang 80ern. Und da gibt es noch nicht so viel Konkurrenz aber je professioneller dieser Markt wird, desto mehr geraten die ins Hintertreffen. Shelley erinnert sich zum Beispiel an ein Spiel, das Avalon Hill rausgebracht hat namens NBA, ein Basketballspiel mit der offiziellen Lizenz der NBA damals, also der amerikanischen Liga. Und Shelley macht da sozusagen die Qualitätssicherung dazu. Also ihm fällt zum Beispiel auf, dass die ganzen Statistiken der Spieler, also der Original-NBA-Spieler dieser Ära, die da drin sind, überhaupt nicht zu dem passen, was die Stärken der Spieler sind. Shelley ist passionierter Basketballspieler. Das wird auch gleich nochmal eine Rolle spielen in der Erzählung. Der kennt sich da aus und er findet das ziemlich hemmsärmlich, wie das da umgesetzt ist. Also er war nicht sonderlich begeistert von dem, was Avalon Hilda gemacht hat. Wovon er aber begeistert ist, ist ein anderes Spiel, das er in dieser Zeit kennenlernt. Ein Freund nämlich empfiehlt ihn, er solle doch mal Pirates spielen. Das Spiel von Sid Meier, von Microprose, das 1987 auf den Markt kommt. Und davon ist Shelley beeindruckt. Und er weiß auch, dass Microprose in der gleichen Stadt sitzt, in Baltimore, im Norden der Stadt. Ja, nun ist Bruce Shelley kein computeraffiner Mensch zu diesem Zeitpunkt. Er war nie ein Programmierer, wird auch nie ein Programmierer. Er ist jemand, der sich mit Design beschäftigt. Aber er überlegt, okay, wie könnte ich da einen Fuß in die Tür bekommen? Das scheint mir schon die Zukunft zu sein mit diesen Computerspielen. Und mit seinen Methoden versucht er sich dann einfach mal an der Entwicklung eines Computerspiel-ähnlichen Projekts. Wie gesagt, er kann nicht programmieren, aber er entwirft für Avalon Hill ein Solo- Kriegsspiel, ein Solo-Strategiespiel. Patterns Best heißt das, kommt 1987 raus und das ist ein Kriegsspiel, das man alleine spielen kann als einzelner Spieler. Sieht aus wie das andere Avalon Hill Kriegsspiel mit vielen, vielen Markern und dicken Regelwerken und sowas. Aber er beschreibt das als eine Fingerübung für Computerspiele, weil er sagt, die meisten Computerspiele zu der Zeit sind ja nun mal Einzelspielerspiele. Nun, es dauert eine ganze Weile, bis er bei Microprose einen Fuß in die Tür bekommt. Er erinnert sich, dass er fast ein Jahr lang versucht hat, da vorstellig zu werden und denen zu verklickern, dass sie jemanden brauchen, der wirklich Spiele machen kann. Gut, ich kann zwar nicht programmieren, aber ich weiß, wie Spielregeln funktionieren. Und schließlich kommt es so weit, dass er tatsächlich angeheuert wird, aber zu ziemlich niedrigem Gehalt. So, nun sind wir bei Microprose. Wie gesagt, da ist er jetzt knapp 40, der Bruce Shelley. Und wir sind im Jahr 1988, als er dort anfängt, als reiner Designer, weil, wie gesagt, äh, bringt er keine Programmierkenntnisse mit. Das ist zwar ungewöhnlich bei Microprose zu der Zeit, aber nicht einzigartig. Im Büro neben ihm zum Beispiel sitzt Lawrence Schick. Das ist ein Name, den man in der Spielebranche auch kennt. Der kommt von TSR, den Machern von Dungeons and Dragons und war dann kurz vorher bei Coleco, den Machern des Coleco Visions, einer eigenen Konsole. Und dann ist er lange Jahre bei Microprose als Designer und Producer und später wechselt er zu Bethesda. Aber ne, der ist auch jemand, der nicht aus dem Programmierhintergrund kommt. Was macht Bruce Shelley jetzt bei Microprose? Er arbeitet als erstes Projekt auf F-19 Stealth Fighter, einer Flugsimulation, und macht da 3D-Modelle und die Karte. Also er baut im Editor Polygon-Modelle der Flieger und bestimmt auf der Karte, okay, wo soll hier eine Flugabwehrstation stehen und wo ein Flugfeld und so weiter. Das ist eine ungewöhnliche Aufgabe für jemanden, der als Designer angeheuert wird. Klar, wir sind ja noch nicht in der Ära, wo 3D-Grafik eine eigene Rolle ist, 3D-Modeller oder sowas, aber sollte er nicht jetzt irgendwie Spiele machen? <lacht> und ich habe im Vorfeld aus anderen Interviews und Quellen und so weiter geguckt, was der so alles gemacht hat bei Microprose, der Bruce Shelley, und das erschien mir schon ziemlich breit gefächert. Also mal war es Recherche, mal Dokumentation, schreibt er Handbücher, macht Budgetanalyse, assistiert Sid Meier, das sind ja alles Zulieferaufgaben. Hat er da eigene Projekte? Verantwortet er was selbst bei Microprose? Und seine Antwort darauf ist, nicht wirklich. In den vier Jahren, die er bei der Firma ist, arbeitet er stellenweise mehr als Producer als als Designer. Er ergänzte dann zum Beispiel noch in der Aufzählung, er hat ein extern entwickeltes Spiel namens Destroyer Escort, hat er als Producer betreut. Er hat die Briefings für Vertriebsteams gemacht, wenn denen Spiele vorgestellt werden mussten. Er hat mit den Layoutern der Handbücher zusammengearbeitet, um die Handbücher zu erstellen. Er hat sich um die Qualitätssicherung gekümmert, Spieletester angeleitet, die Backlisten gepflegt. Alles Mögliche. Nur nicht so richtig Spiele machen. 
Aber das kommt ja dann durch die Arbeit mit Sid Meier. Und da muss man auch noch dazu sagen, er ist Sid Meier nie unterstellt, sondern arbeitet im Entwicklerteam von Microprose. Das nennt sich MPS Labs. Und da gibt es einen Chef, einen Leiter davon. Das ist erst Steve Meier und dann später auch zur Zeit von Civilization Ted Markley. Und das sind die Vorgesetzten von Bruce Shelley, nicht Sid Meier. Was uns immer interessiert ist, wie sah es denn da in dem Büro damals aus beim Microprose? Da hat er uns mal so mental ein bisschen durchgeführt. Ungefähr 100 Leute hatte Microprose Ende der 80er, sagt Bruce. Natürlich mit also schon richtigen Hierarchien, Abteilungen, die Abteilungsleiter haben und so. Und das sei da in Hunt Valley, in einem Vorort von Baltimore, ein langes, flaches Gebäude gewesen, einstöckig. Am Anfang im Eingangsbereich mit großem Konferenzraum und dann war es im Endeffekt auf zwei Flügel aufgeteilt. Links die Geschäftsführung und die ganzen Marketing-Sales-Abteilungen. Auch ein Lagerhaus gehört damit dazu, wo die ganzen Produkte, Packungen und sowas gelagert und versandfertig gemacht werden. Und der ganze rechte Flügel, die Entwicklungsabteilung. Das erste Büro dort auf der rechten Seite, ein sehr großes Büro, das von Sid Meier. Dann eine Gangschleife um so einen Innenhof und da reihen sich Einzelbüros aneinander. Also keine Großraumbüros. Bruce hat ein Einzelbüro in der hintersten Ecke. Daneben sitzt, wie gesagt, Lawrence Schick ihm gegenüber. Büros von zwei Programmierern und so mischen sich da die ganzen Disziplinen in der Entwicklungsabteilung. Gibt Büros für Grafiker, Büros für Programmierer, Büros für Designer und so weiter. Sid Meier lernt Bruce Shelley dann kennen, weil die auf dem gleichen Projekt arbeiten. Dieses F-19 Stealth Fighter ist ein Projekt, auf dem Sid Meier der Chefdesigner ist. Und logischerweise trifft man sich dann in Meetings und redet. Bruce beschreibt Sid Meier als eine stille Person, eine distanzierte Person, die erstmal, wo man erstmal eine ganze Weile braucht, bis die auftaut. Aber die beiden verstehen sich ganz gut. Bruce hat so drei Gründe beschrieben, von woher das kommt. Also zum einen, die haben gemeinsame Interessen. Die sind beide sehr interessiert an Geschichte, lesen beide viel, aber vor allem sind sie sehr interessiert an Spieldesign, an dem Handwerk des Spieldesigns und darüber kommen sie sehr schnell ins Fachsimpeln. Dann gibt es gemeinsame Brettspielabende, wo Bruce Spiele mitbringt, zum Beispiel sein 1830 oder auch das Civilization Brettspiel von Avalon Hill, das schon existiert zu dem Zeitpunkt, übrigens auch von Francis Thrasham aus England. Da nimmt auch Sid Meier teil, das schweißt die näher zusammen und dann sagt Bruce, er war halt auch einfach bereit, anderen Menschen Aufgaben abzunehmen, die sie nicht machen wollten und das macht er auch bei Sid. Der ist bereit, Dinge zu tun für Sid, auf die der keine Lust hat. So kommt es, dass also Sid ihn irgendwann fragt, ob er ihm bei seinem nächsten Spiel assistieren will. Das ist dann Railroad Tycoon. Das ist eine Ära, wo Bruce sagt, er war begeistert davon, von dieser Möglichkeit. Er liebt den Job, er findet die Spiele toll, er findet die Arbeit mit Sid Meier, den er für ein Genie hält, großartig. Er ist auch noch gerade verliebt in seine spätere Ehefrau. Es läuft für ihn. Ja, er sagt, in der Zeit hätte er da auch umsonst gearbeitet. Und Sid und er verstehen sich super, machen Recherchereisen zusammen zum Eisenbahnmuseum zum Beispiel, gehen gemeinsam Mittagessen. Später, als Bruce dann heiratet, ist Sid da auch mit dabei. Die beiden freunden sich an. Eines Tages sind sie dann in einem Steakhouse beim Essen und eigentlich muss Sid Meier an einem Agentenspiel namens Covert Action arbeiten, würde aber viel lieber dieses Eisenbahnspiel machen, an dem er rumgebastelt hat und fragt den Bruce dann offensichtlich, was der davon hält und Bruce sagt, ja klar. Die Eisenbahn, ja, woraufhin dann Railroad Tycoon entsteht. Das ist das erste Spiel, wo sie kooperieren. Danach kommt Covert Action, wo sie auch zusammenarbeiten. Aber das ist kein Liebesprojekt für keinen der beiden. Das müssen sie machen, weil die Chefetage das möchte. Bruce erzählte, dass alle Vorschläge, die er angebracht hat, um das Spiel besser zu machen, von Sid dann meistens auch abgelehnt wurden mit dem Hinweis darauf, dass das Spiel jetzt einfach fertig werden muss. Ja, das muss jetzt nicht unbedingt besser werden, sondern einfach nur zu Ende gehen. Denn sie wollen dann Civilization machen. Wir haben ein bisschen über diese Chefetage gesprochen, denn die Chefetage, das heißt Bill Steely. Bill Steely ist der Mitgründer von Microprose und der Miteigentümer. Ihm und Sid Meier gehört die Firma zu jeweils 50 Prozent und Steely ist der Geschäftsführer, also derjenige, der die Managementansagen im Tagesgeschäft macht. Und er ist ein, ein Charakter, sagen wir mal, ein ehemaliger Air Force Pilot, sehr extrovertierter, lauter Mensch. Und Bruce erinnert sich, dass auch Führungskräfte gegangen sind bei Microprose, weil sie mit Steely nicht klarkamen. Der Steve Meyer zum Beispiel, sein erster Chef, bei dem sei das so gewesen. Und da gibt es eine ganz hübsche Anekdote, die er erzählt hat und die so mit einzahlt auf dieses Konto, dass Steely ein schwieriger Mensch gewesen sein muss und obwohl das im Unternehmen auch manchmal zu Spannungen führte. Denn ich sage, 
sagte vorhin schon, der Bruce Shelley ist ein passionierter Basketballspieler. Zu der Zeit spielt er mehrmals in der Woche, er ist auch ein großer Mensch, knapp 1,90. Und dann findet er raus, dass bei Microprose auch Basketball gespielt wird. Im Lagerhaus, im firmeneigenen Lagerhaus, gibt es auch einen kleinen Basketballcourt. Und dort spielen dann regelmäßig Leute, nicht unbedingt aus der Entwicklungsabteilung, von den Nerds, sondern eher aus den anderen Abteilungen, vor allem auch die Manager, die Führungskräfte spielen da Basketball. Und weil Bruce da mitmacht, lernt er dann die Manager kennen. Die anderen Designer in der Entwicklungsabteilung wundern sich immer, warum er von den Marketingleuten auf den Gang gegrüßt wird. Hey Bruce, wie geht's dir? Ha, woher kennst du die denn? Ja, aber das bringt halt zusammen dieser Sport. Und wer da auch mitspielt bei diesen Basketballspielen, das ist Bill Steely, der Geschäftsführer. Bruce erinnert sich, dass der hart gespielt hätte. Das war ein aggressiver Spieler. Aber Bruce hält da dagegen und in einer Situation seien sie beide den Ball nachgejagt und dabei habe er Steely umgehauen. Ja, jetzt nicht mit Absicht, aber halt mit einem harten Spiel. Ja, und als Steely da am Boden liegt und offensichtlich nach Luft ringt, da denkt Bruce Shelley, so, jetzt bin ich mein Job los. Ich habe hier gerade den Geschäftsführer fast K.O. gehauen, aber Steely steht wieder auf und das Spiel geht weiter. Und nach dem Spiel, als Bruce dann duscht geht und die anderen Manager von Micropros auch, da klatschen die ihn alle ab und gratulieren ihm dazu, das habe er sehr gut gemacht. Ja, also da scheinen sich alle insgesamt gefreut zu haben, dass jemand mal den Stili umgehauen hat. Bruce sagt aber, er glaubt, dass Bill Steely und Sid Meier, soweit er das mitbekommen hat, gut miteinander auskamen. Er hat da zumindest nie irgendwelche Animositäten erlebt zwischen den beiden. Aber er hatte schon den Eindruck, dass Bill Steely den Sid Meier eher duldet, ja, weil der halt lukrative Spiele macht, aber für den Geschäftsmann Bill Steely ist Sid Meier eher unberechenbar. Der will sein eigenes Zeug machen und er kann eigentlich nur darauf hoffen, dass das Genie Sid Meier halt mal wieder einen neuen Hit schreibt. Damit sind wir bei Civilization, eigentlich auch wieder eines von diesen Spielen, was anfängt als eine Sid Meier'sche Marotte. Da ist Sid Meier übrigens dann schon nicht mehr Partner der Firma. Bill Steely hat ihm seine Anteile abgekauft, aber das weiß zu diesem Zeitpunkt noch keiner. So arbeitet Sid Meier dann an Civilization und nimmt wieder die gleiche Arbeitsteilung vor wie bei Railroad Tycoon, weil das schon gut geklappt hat, nämlich mit Bruce Shelley als seinem Assistenten sozusagen. Wie kam es überhaupt zu der Idee zu Civilization? Also die Eisenbahn-Anekdote, die Sid Meier dazu gerne erzählt, dass sie in, in einem Zug der Gedanke kam, wir müssten jetzt mal ein Spiel über die Weltgeschichte machen, da kann sich Bruce Shelley nicht dran erinnern, aber er sagt, die Einflüsse, die auf sie gewirkt haben in dieser Zeit, andere Spiele zumal, die seien schon alle sehr stark in diese Richtung gegangen. Das ist das, das Brettspiel Civilization von Avalon Hill, Sim City damals, Empire, ein Kriegsspiel das auch so eine weltumspannende Dimension hat. Das alles wäre mehr oder weniger naheliegend gewesen, um dann zu Civilization, zu dieser Idee zu führen. Und Sid Meier habe in der Zeit damals immer so kleine Prototypen gebaut. Bruce Shelley erinnerte sich an einen Prototypen, wo man in Blutstrom unterwegs war von einem menschlichen Körper. Ein anderer Prototyp, wo eine Familie den amerikanischen Westen besiedelt hat und Kinder bekommt und dann so ein scheinbar so ein generationenübergreifendes Besiedelungsspiel daraus wird. Alles nur Fingerübungen. Und im Mai 1990 drückt Sid Meier dem Bruce Shelley dann eine Diskette in die Hand und darauf befindet sich ein Prototyp von Civilization. Noch weit entfernt von dem, was das Spiel dann werden wird. Hier noch eher an SimCity angelehnt und in Echtzeit und sowas. Aber damit ist die Idee in der Welt und Bruce Shelley findet es großartig. Also er ist direkt überzeugt davon, dass das ein Spiel ist, das viel Potenzial hat. Diese Diskette übrigens hat er aufgehoben. Das war ihm auch wichtig, das zu erzählen, weil er den ersten Prototypen von Railroad Tycoon damals eben nicht aufgehoben habe. Und bei Sif wollte er diesen Fehler nicht nochmal machen. Und er erzählte, dass er später dann mal die einem Museum spenden wollte, vermutlich dem Strong Museum of Play in den USA. Und dann aber den Sid Meier gefragt habe, ob das eigentlich okay ist, dass er das da hingibt. Und Sid dann gesagt habe, hm, schick sie mal lieber wieder an mich zurück. Und so sei sie dann an Firexis gegangen, die Firma von Sid Meier heutzutage. Und dort sei es dem Team von Sid Meier dann gelungen, die auch wieder herzustellen, diese Version, so dass offensichtlich bei Firexis diese Urversion, der erste Prototyp von Civilization existiert heute. Jedenfalls beschreibt Bruce Shelley dann die Zusammenarbeit zwischen Sid Meier und ihm bei Civilization, die wieder so ähnlich war wie bei Railroad Tycoon. Sid Meier macht das Spiel, programmiert es, entwirft es und jeden Tag gibt er Bruce Shelley am Abend die neueste Version. Der spielt sie dann 
Am nächsten Morgen, wenn Sittmeier reinkommt, dann setzen sich die beiden in seinem Büro zusammen und diskutieren das Spielerlebnis. Was könnte man verbessern? Was hat funktioniert? Was nicht? Dann setzt sich Sittmeier wieder an die Programmierung für den Rest des Tages. Abends ist die nächste Version fertig und das Spielchen geht von vorne los. Also es ist so ein ständiger Kreislauf von Prototyp, Beurteilung, Prototyp, Beurteilung zwischen den beiden. Und zunächst mal auch wirklich nur zwischen den beiden. Über längere Zeit hält Sid Meier das Spiel ansonsten geheim. Warum ausgerechnet Bruce? Naja, zum einen, weil die schon vorher bei Radio Tycoon gut zusammengearbeitet haben. Zum anderen aber meint Bruce, dass Sid Meier in ihm so eine Art jedermann gesehen habe. Also jemand, der in der Zielgruppe nahe ist, der gut reflektieren kann, was die Zielgruppe möchte. Und wenn Bruce Shelley also sagte, na, no, das finde ich gut und das finde ich weniger gut, dass Sid Meier dann angenommen hätte, ja, dann wird es den meisten Menschen da draußen auch so gehen. Ich war ein bisschen skeptisch, ob Bruce Shelley da sein Licht nicht zu sehr unter den Scheffel stellt. Pointiertes, gutes Feedback, hochwertiges Feedback ist ja nun auch super relevant. Aber der Punkt ist hier an dieser Stelle, das war im Gespräch schon auch klar, Bruce hat das Spiel nicht designt, hat da nicht dran mitdesignt in diesem Sinne, sondern er hat mitgewirkt an diesem Feedback-Zyklus wo Sid Meier die Sachen macht und wo Shelley sie dann beurteilt und Feedback gibt. Das ist aber eine Arbeit, die Bruce Shelley genießt. Also ihm macht das wirklich großen Spaß. Er findet das faszinierende Designarbeit. Die beiden arbeiten heraus, was sind spaßige Entscheidungen, was funktioniert in diesem ständigen Spielen, Testen, Spielen, Testen Ablauf. Und er erzählte so nebenbei, dass später, als die beiden das offener gemacht haben, also als auch der Rest der Firma das mitbekommen habe, der Kollege, der da nebenan im Büro saß von Sid Meier, also über den Gang hinweg, dass der dem, ihm später mal erzählt habe, also wenn du und Sid zusammensitzen, und über Civilization sprechen, dann kann ich nicht mehr arbeiten. Dann muss ich entweder meine Tür zu machen oder ich muss euch zuhören, weil das so spannend ist, was ihr da besprecht. Es ist übrigens ganz interessant, weil Bruce Shelley sagte, dass das so lange nur zwischen den beiden ist, dass er also der Einzige war, der Feedback gegeben hat zu dem Spiel. Das findet er im Nachhinein gar nicht so doll, weil die Tatsache, dass nur er das gesehen hat über einen langen Zeitraum, bedeutete, dass nach hinten raus die Zeit fehlte, dass andere Menschen das Spiel auch testen können. Und er schiebt die Tatsache, dass auch im ersten Civilization Fehler oder nicht ganz so günstige Entscheidungen drin sind, unter anderem auch darauf, dass es halt schwerpunktmäßig nur ein Mensch gesehen und beurteilt hat über einen langen Zeitpunkt. Und das ist eine Erkenntnis, die er für das nächste große Projekt, bei dem er dann mitgearbeitet hat, nämlich Age of Empires bei den Ensemble Studios mitgenommen habe. Und dass ein wichtiger Punkt bei Ensemble gewesen sei, dass die ganze Firma und auch externe Leute ziemlich früh anfangen, ihr Spiel zu spielen und zu testen, sodass man breites Feedback statt spitzen Feedback bekommt. Nun, als Civilization dann auch in der Firma geteilt wird, erweist es sich als super populär, alle lieben es und das ist ja eigentlich ein ganz gutes Omen. Das Problem ist nur, dass Sid Meier ja nicht der Chef der Entwicklungsabteilung ist und so ein Spiel wie Civilization braucht irgendwann auch mal Grafiken, Musik und so weiter, aber der Chef der Entwicklungsabteilung, Ted Markley zu diesem Zeitpunkt, wird nicht für Sid Meiers Projekte bezahlt. Deswegen sei es sehr schwer gewesen, Unterstützung von ihm zu bekommen. Also das Spiel muss offiziell erstmal den Status erreichen, wo es in die Produktion kommt, grünes Licht bekommt und dann da auch Ressourcen aus der Entwicklungsabteilung draufgehen und das hätte wohl viel länger gedauert, als es hätte sein müssen. Bruce Shelley ist da auch immer, na, immer noch ein bisschen sauer darüber, weil am Ende nämlich sich das Spiel tatsächlich verspätet hat. Also Civilization hat seinen ursprünglichen Fertigstellungstermin gerissen und das lag laut Bruce Shelley daran, dass sie halt zu spät die Unterstützung aus der Entwicklungsabteilung bekommen hätten und dafür wurden aber ihm und den anderen der Bonus gekürzt. Also ein monetärer Nachteil für etwas, was sie eigentlich gar nicht verschuldet hätten, erzählt Bruce Shelley. Mir war es wichtig, mit ihm auch über das Thema Grafik zu reden, weil ich bin ein großer Fan der Grafik von Civilization und ich glaube, dass er es auch einen wesentlichen Anteil am Erfolg hat. Und ich habe ihn gefragt, wie waren das eigentlich? Wir hatten die Entscheidungen getroffen, wie viel Grafik da reinkommt und was für Grafik. Und Bruce erinnerte sich da wenig dran an diese ganze Geschichte. Ich wusste schon, dass ihm Grafik nicht so wichtig ist. Das hat er auch schon mal in einem GDC-Talk gesagt. Das hat sich hier auch nochmal bewahrheitet. Er spezifisch, und er vermutet auch, Sid Meier haben sich nicht so viele Gedanken 
Gedanken um die grafische Darstellung gemacht. Da gab es einen Art Director damals bei Michael Prose, Michael Hare und der hat laut Bruce da großartige Arbeit geleistet. Der hat sich das angenommen, der hatte die Designentscheidungen getroffen und der ist dann die visuelle Ausgestaltung von Civilization passiert bei Michael Hare und dessen Stab, dessen Team von Grafikerinnen und Grafikern. Auch was das Interface Design angeht, die Lesbarkeit, die bei Civilization sehr gut gelungen ist, hat Bruce keine Erinnerung daran, dass er da irgendwie mitgewirkt habe. Er sagt, im Zweifel war das alles Sid Meier. Wie wäre denn dann eigentlich ein Civilization ohne Bruce Shelley geworden? Wie würde das aussehen? Wollte ich von ihm wissen. Und er sagte, na ja, vermutlich sehr ähnlich zu dem, wie Civilization dann heute aussieht. Wobei, äh, muss man schon ein bisschen einschränken, hat er auch ein bisschen eingeschränkt. Er nimmt an, wenn da jetzt Sid Meier sich einen anderen Designer bei Microprose als Partner gesucht hätte, gab er noch andere, dann könnte es schon sein, dass die vielleicht ihre Ideen mehr gepusht hätten, dass die überzeugter davon gewesen wären, dass sie gute Ideen haben, die mit, mit rein müssen. Und Bruce Shelley beschreibt das unterschwellig zwischen den Zeilen, beschreibt er sich da in einem einer Rolle, die das Feedback uneitel gibt und sagt, okay, pass auf, das meine ich dazu, aber na, das ist deine Sache, da eine Entscheidung daraus zu treffen. Wenn du der Meinung bist, nee, mein Vorschlag ist nicht gut, ja, dann okay, macht nichts. Das ist dein Spiel. Und das macht es, glaube ich, Sittmeier auch leicht, weil er da nicht gegen Widerstände ankämpfen muss oder sich verpflichtet fühlt, irgendwas einzubauen, sondern sozusagen die Rosinen rausbecken kann. Das ist zumindest Bruce's Interpretation, aber Bruce sagte auch, also mit Sicherheit war Civilization wichtiger für mich und mein Leben und meine spätere Karriere, als ich wichtig für Civilization war. Diesen Unterschied, den Civilization und die Arbeit daran in Bruce's Leben macht, der kommt aber erst später. Das schlägt sich in dem Moment bei Microprose erstmal nicht nieder. Es dauert auch eine Weile, bis klar ist, dass Civilization ein Erfolg ist, als es dann Ende 1990 im Markt ist, womit sich Sid Meier und Microprose auch erstmal beschäftigen, sind neue Versionen des Spiels, das sind Bugs auszubügeln, Balancing-Probleme. Das muss erstmal passieren in den nächsten Monaten. Ich habe ihn gefragt, ob man denn merken konnte bei Microprose, dass der Erfolg von Civilization irgendwie ein Umdenken herbeigeführt habe, was für Spiele erfolgreich sind, was gemacht werden darf bei Microprose. Da musste er ein bisschen überlegen und sagte vage, ja, vielleicht dürften dann da die Entwickler, Designer auch andere Ideen verfolgen, aber es schien jetzt nicht super greifbar zu sein. Das Problem ist, Bruce mag seinen Job, wie wir schon gesagt haben, aber es ist finanziell schwierig. Er bekommt da ein relativ niedriges Gehalt, er weiß das auch durch Vergleiche mit anderen Designern und seine Frau ist gerade zu Hause ohne Arbeit, die ist eine erfolgreiche Bankmanagerin, hat sich aber ein Jahr Sabbatical sozusagen genommen, eine Auszeit, während sie einen neuen Job sucht und schließlich bekommt sie dann ein Angebot bei einer Bank in Chicago als Managerin und verdient da als Einstiegsgehalt das Dreifache von dem was Bruce bei Microprose bekommt. Tja, und das ist letztendlich der ausschlaggebende Faktor, denn obwohl Bruce Shelley bei Microprose Gehaltserhöhungen bekommen hat, bringt ihn das nicht dorthin, wo er möchte, nicht auf das Niveau der anderen Designer. Auch die Arbeit ist nicht mehr die gleiche. Sid Meier ist ausgebrannt nach Civilization. Der arbeitet zwar mit Bruce Shelley so nebenbei noch an einem Kriegsspiel, an einem Wargame über den amerikanischen Bürgerkrieg, aber das dümpelt nur eher vor sich hin. Das ist jetzt kein Projekt, das den gleichen Drive, den gleichen Spirit hätte wie Railroad Tycoon oder Civilization. Und Bruce ist sich auch nicht sicher, wie es bei Microprose eigentlich weitergehen soll. Die Firma scheint auch in Schwierigkeiten zu sein. Da war dieses Arcade-Spiele-Abenteuer von Bill Steely, das teuer war und letztendlich ein Flop. Also alle Zeichen stehen dafür, dass es vielleicht Zeit ist, weiterzuziehen. Und vor allen Dingen, das ist aber der entscheidende Punkt, er sagte, wir konnten vom Gehalt meiner Frau alleine leben, aber nicht von meinem Gehalt bei Microprose alleine. Alleine. Und so entscheiden sie sich also dann nach Chicago zu ziehen und Bruce hört bei Microprose auf. Ich fand das ein bisschen seltsam. Nicht aus der Perspektive von Bruce Shelley, völlig nachvollziehbar die Entscheidung. Ich fand es seltsam aus der Perspektive von Sid Meier. Wieso lässt jemand wie Sid Meier so jemanden wie Bruce Shelley gehen? Die hatten diese coole Kooperation. Warum setzt sich Sid Meier, der doch, selbst wenn er nicht mehr in der Firma beteiligt ist, da immer noch was zu sagen hat, dass ein Wort Gewicht hat, warum setzt er sich nicht dafür ein, dass ein Bruce Shelley ein besseres Gehalt bekommt zum Beispiel? Und Bruce, also mal abgesehen davon, dass Sid Meier, glaube ich, auch mit eigenen Problemen zu kämpfen hatte zu der Zeit, sagt Bruce, naja, wir haben da halt nie drüber gesprochen. <lacht> er sagte mir, dass, ja, das war jetzt keine so große Sache, aber ich stelle mir das so vor, dass er halt einfach mit dem Sid nie über seine finanzielle Situation geredet hat und der Sid Meier vermutlich gar nicht 
recht wusste, wie es Bruce Shelley damit eigentlich geht. Nun jedenfalls schmeißen ihm die Kollegen noch eine schicke Abschiedsparty mit Dresscode und allem und dann zieht er weiter nach Chicago, hat erstmal keinen Anschlussjob, findet dann aber einen und schreibt erstmal über die nächsten Jahre Lösungsbücher, Strategy Guides, unter anderem auch für Colonization von Microprose, also für das Spiel, das auf Basis von Civilization als nächstes entsteht. Und dann kommt er ja schließlich zu Ensemble und arbeitet da maßgeblich an Age of Empires mit und landet damit den zweiten großen Hit seiner Karriere. Das war das Gespräch mit Bruce Shelley. Das waren die wesentlichen Erkenntnisse daraus und meine Zusammenfassung. Wie gesagt, mir hat das große Freude gemacht, mit ihm zu sprechen. Bruce Shelley ist ein bescheidener, sehr höflicher, sehr freundlicher Mensch. Und ich bin sehr froh, nicht nur, dass er in Civilization mitgearbeitet hat in Age of Empires, sondern dass wir die Gelegenheit hatten, mit ihm zu sprechen. An dieser Stelle also nochmal Danke an Bruce und danke an euch fürs Zuhören. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Musik 